Okay, I believe we are live. Am I correct on that? Hello, crew. I am not seeing anything in... Oh, there I am. Hi, I'm on my app. <laughs> Hi, viewers. I'm Midori. Thanks for joining us again for another episode of Consent Dojo with Shibari Study. It is, uh, it is my joy and privilege to introduce uh, my dear, dear friend, Sophia. And I'm also grateful for Shibari Study for making this unique platform happen because the discussion of consent, rope, kink, and agency, it's not easy. It is neither simple nor easy, yet absolutely necessary. And if you have an opportunity to check out the previous videos, please do so. Uh, it is a nuanced, nuanced and beautiful thing. And the more you get your consent muscle built, the hotter your play can be. Now, Sophia here, uh, who is a pronoun she, her, what is pronoun? Please. She, her, okay. So she is logging in from Seattle, Washington, the beautiful city, the emerald of the Pacific Northwest. We go back, what, 20 some years now? I think so. Yeah, you are a dear human being, a fantastic friend, an amazing colleague, and a curator with whom we have um, crossed swords in the best of ways. Uh, and Sophia's also been key in terms of allowing me to, giving me a platform to express some of my more controversial artwork. And I particularly wanted to invite her to Consent Dojo because the intersection of art, kink, shibari, and consent. And, and here we are in the middle of Roptober, and I hope some of you all have been enjoying the images being created by other members, and maybe you've been submitting that yourself. But um, Sophia goes a long way in the connection between rope, kink, and art. So with no further ado, here's Sophia, and if you would give your official blurb. <laughs> Thank you, Midori. Um, I'm super glad to be here. I've been involved in the Seattle Erotic Art Festival since it started in 2003. Um, and this is our 19th year, and the Seattle Erotic Art Festival really focuses on giving room and place for erotic art to have a platform that it can't always find in mainstream art galleries or art festivals. And one of the biggest things that I want to make happen is I want to really get people to think about our sex and our sexuality and why it's so important that we honor this part of ourselves because who we love and how we love and who we have sex with and how we have sex with is a big core part of our internal uh, sense of identity. And that's we have to honor that in order to be whole and happy people. So I really want to create a space with the Seattle Erotic Art Festival where people can go to see art and see themselves reflected in it, hopefully, at least one piece. Um, and then also to see other forms of loving and other forms of sex and other forms of kink um, so that they can maybe look at it and see the joy of other people participating in something that's not their thing and go, oh, that's why they like that. Now I understand. Um, you know, when we can understand other people's joy, it makes them more human and then it, it makes the us bigger. <clears throat> um, so that's my big thing. And consent is, is a huge part of that. Um, and is a difficult thing when it comes to art, uh, especially when we're talking about art and kink, because I'm sure you've covered this and other ideas about, you know, when we're talking about doing rope or doing kink of some kind, there's always a, well, is my defini definition of bondage the same as your definition of bondage? Um, and then it gets even harder when you throw in performing and uh, arti artistic, uh, you know, like paintings or photographs. And the viewers here, Sophia, will range in experience in rope, range in experience in kink, range in experience in erotic art and art as well. Um, uh, oh, also uh, for viewers, if we start talking about SEAF, that's oh, yeah. for Seattle Erotic Art Festival. 
Thank now, you. Around Sif, uh, do this is a juried art show, right? Yes, seventy-five percent of our art is juried by. Um, we have a jury that's a different uh, every year. You've served on the jury in the past before, and um, and then twenty-five percent of it is uh, invited art of where we either have a guest curator um, and uh, our curator from the festival who goes out and finds people. We usually invite people to make sure to fill in the niches to go, ooh, we didn't get a whole lot of non-binary artists this year. We better go out and invite some more. You know, so because we are dependent on who submits art to the jury, we always want to make sure that we're being as diverse and inclusive as possible. So that's why we do have a big chunk that is invited. And speaking of submitting art, uh, is it just for the Seattle area, or where can people? Worldwide, it? if you can, if somebody can ship their art to us, we we will we will show it. Yeah. So we have um, this year, I believe we have um, 19 different countries represented in the art that was accepted, and I can't remember how many different U.S. states there are. I, I want to say it's close to 30. Um, so, viewers, um, if you create erotic art or art that, well, you'll get the, Sophia, you'll talk about erotic art, but <laughs> if you create work that that you want that you want to submit to see, you should give it a try. Check out the site, see what kind of work is there. You may be surprised that it's not what may usually pass for erotic art. Uh, it's, it's a challenging and broad scope exhibition and now how frequently does this happen once a year um this year's a little different because pandemic um and we're having the art festival this um the end of this month in october but normally it happens at the end of april every year so we're going to be doing a quick turnaround to get back on schedule um, so the call for art will open up in January this year, uh, uh, January 2022. And um, we always, um, especially, we need good rope art. <laughs> I'm, um, I, uh, one of the things that is always kind of a little bit uh, frustrating is the, the rope that looks like it will fall off as soon as somebody shrugs their shoulders. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah. And for me, that uh, imagery that looks either cliche or the participants look beige. Uh. Check out. Yeah, check out. Um, and the work, folks, the work's actually available for purchase. I've actually purchased several of the visual art pieces as well. And I'm now making more uh, space in. Um, office space I'm making to put some of these artwork up. So the, the work is can be purchased, right? Correct. All the art is for sale. Um, very rarely do we have art that's not for sale. You know, occasionally there will be something that is just too good not to show everybody. Um, but we're all about supporting living artists. Um, and, you know, uh, a lot of our artists, this is the first time they've ever shown their art. So if somebody's like, oh, but I'm not a real artist, I'm like, there is no such thing as a real artist. You're either making something artistic or you're not. And if it's artistic to you, and especially if it's um, really sings out how you feel about your sexuality, about how you feel about your kink, your loves, your relationships, your identity, um, that's, that's gonna matter to somebody. That's gonna be so important for somebody to have an awakening. One of the most, my most favorite uh, stories about Seif was somebody coming in um, who was uh, coming to their first public events after they came out as trans. And it was in a public space and it was a really big deal. And she walked in and she said, seeing art where there were people like her as models in the art, where there were people like her around, where everybody used she, her pronouns for her. And, you know, she just said it was one of the most accepting, wonderful places to be. And that's that's what I want. I want to create that space of um, of juicy authenticity around our sex and our kink and our love. Nice, nice. Representation matters. Uh, in terms mm -hmm. of the purchasing artwork, now that with pandemic and with the event going online, can it used to be that people had to purchase when they were physically present? Has that changed? 
that has changed. So what we did um, for 2020 uh, is we actually did a lot of virtual tours with the art so that I could carry around a little iPad and show everybody the art in the gallery. Um, and then they were able to do the purchase online. And so that is going to be something that we're, uh, that will be available this year and people can make appointments um, through seattleerotic.org where they'll be able to email somebody and make an appointment to have a time to see the art. So, you know, if somebody's in Germany, if somebody's in Barcelona, you know, this is, if they have an interconnect connection, I can show them the art festival and take them on a tour. Fantastic. So let's dive into talking about art and consent. I know you have um, particularly uh, salient points and strong points you want to make. So I'm just going to pass that pr proverbial talking stick to you. Go. Awesome. Um, well, one of my, um, one of my big things that I find so tricky about consent in art is that I'm a big fan of content warnings um, because I think it matters to be able to say when you come to the Seattle Erotic Art Festival, you will see many depictions of sex and kink and many relationships depicted, many orientations, sexual orientations, all sorts of genders along the gender spectrum. However, what I can't do is I can't prepare people for how that's going to make them feel. Um, and so that's one of the biggest things about when we, when we talk about consent in art is the idea that you can consent to the subject matter being depicted, but you, there's no way that you can with knowledge consent to how it's going to make you feel because we don't know what that's going to be. It's kind of easy to say, well, there's going to be some uh, some rope work that depicts concepts of shame. But somebody could look at it and go, I don't I don't understand. Where's the shame? That doesn't make any sense to me. This is a dumb piece of art. So it's better not to say what the art is about at all, because art is kind of like a mirror in that. Mm -hmm it lets us see the stories that are all already inside of us. It reflects back all of our feelings about our past experiences. Um, the way we see, see art, the way we see the world is colored by our experiences and our, um, uh, you know, of, of all flavors, whether they're sexual experiences, family of origin stories, um, our cultural experiences, all of that comes together to make uh, the stories that we perceive in art around us. So it's in a lot of ways, art is non-consensual and there's, and it's kind of like being in one of those, you know, consensual, non-consensual relationships where you just have to go, I'm going to feel things. And I, you know, and that's what, that's the closest we can get, I think, to having consent um, when it comes to viewing art. I'm curious on your thoughts on that. Yeah. yeah that's Oh, I have an echo. Okay, I don't know why. Echo. I'm gonna keep talking. Keep going. I don't hear it. Okay, great. Um. Yeah, I. I go to see art, erotic or not, to have an experience or reaction. And I don't expect a particular outcome. Mm -hmm. I think it's in a way it's a lot like seeing as well that I'm consenting to an adventure, but I have I have to let go of the expectation of an outcome. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's a beautiful analogy. Yeah. Now, okay, since this is Shibari study. Can I ask about your personal involvement with rope? Oh, most definitely. Um, uh, I have been, um, well, I started tying myself up when I was underage by myself. And, uh, and I tied up my first boy when I was 17. Uh, <laughs> and um, and I, uh, I identify as a switch in, in the sense that I sometimes like to be the one who is tying people up and then I also like to be the one who is being tied up. Um, if I can get them both at the same time, that's the juiciest ever. <laughs> um, and, uh, and 
I really enjoy doing um, doing rope uh, as performance in the sense that I combine it. My personal way of doing that is combining it with the aerial training that I've got. So it's half tissue or, or half silks and half uh, bondage. And for me, uh, performing with bondage is very different than being in scene or playing with bondage um, because all the rules completely change um, when you're performing because it is uh, you're now in service to a higher ideal of you know it's almost like you uh, both people who are um, or uh, all the participants of the performance are bottoming to the artistic vision um, which has its own different set of consent rules in it because yeah, I've almost broke my thumb uh, during a performance because, you know, my thumb got stuck in between the rope and the ring, but I was in the middle of a trick, so wasn't going to stop it and go, ooch, ouch, you know, red. My thumb is being pinched. It was a performance. I had to keep going, you know, because I was, uh, because I had a goal that I was trying to achieve that I was willing to put my personal safety aside for. Yeah, yep. I've had similar situation where uh, I was doing a a performance that involved rope, and it was a solo piece of performance art. I'm going to be clear on that that it wasn't a bondage performance. It was performance art that involved rope use, mm -hmm. but in the middle of it, there was a little bit of a glitch, and I essentially injured my rotator cuff. But fortunately, I was strong enough that I was actually augmenting it with my bodily strength. If that were a scene, I would have totally done something different. But the objective being creating a performative space and entertainment, I kept going and then I had to visit a physical therapist. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd be curious, now, you and I are already talking around and, and making assumptions of commonality that may not be, be uh, something that some of the viewers have thought about. The difference between scene and performance, play versus art. Want to run with that one? Sure. I'll go off in a one direction and feel free to fill in areas around. Um, I think that uh, often, uh, especially with um, Japanese-inspired rope bondage, and I'm going to use that terminology because I don't speak Japanese, and you know I'm I'm a dirty American, and um, I don't speak other languages besides English well enough to try anything. Uh, so I apologize for any uh, for any lack of specifics there, um, and. There is such a focus on the artistic elements of it that I think a lot of time the inter, uh, interaction of sexual play gets lost when a lot of people talk about bond doing bondage, especially when pictures are involved, especially when there's uh, the idea of making art. And those are two such very different things in the sense of when I'm in bondage, and I'm having difficulty and pain, and I start saying, I can't do this anymore. If I'm in an art situation and somebody says, give me five more seconds so I can get one more shot, that's acceptable. But if I'm in a play situation and somebody says, come on, you can give me five more seconds, that's unacceptable. And I don't know how to use, ver like, use words to de define the difference between art and play in that sense um, is like how do we how do we say this is the ultimate difference? And I think the uh, and I th I think it comes down to what are our expectations and our risk tolerance um, if because it's really kind of a heady thing to be able to say yeah I injured myself doing that photo shoot but look at that piece of art that's up on the wall that shows that that dedication that I had to creating that vision. 
mm-hmm. that to me is worth it. There are going to be some people out there in the world that that's not, nothing is ever going to be worth that for them. Um, and at the same time, it's like, if there's not, if there's not a spoken pre, uh, pre-negotiated idea that what we're doing is creating art, if I say I can't do it anymore, I'm done. You know, ropes start coming off. Um, I would. It's it's interesting that what I would accept as uh, as treatment in one in art, I would not accept in play. It's funny from the side of um, styling and casting and topping and dominating. I'm using those four words very intentionally. Yeah, very, very different. Very intentionally, right? From that perspective, <clears throat> okay, for, I think that the, <clears throat> I often notice that the term topping with rope or, I'll be honest, I'm not a fan of the word rigor because I have so many friends who are um, theater riggers who are certified, theater, it means certified something. union card carrying theater stage hand riggers that, um, I also find the term in terms of play focuses on the technique so much as opposed to the the personhood and the responsibility of the person casting rope. I find that the most neutral term is I'm the one putting on rope or I'm casting rope. Mm-hmm. So that's an action, but the context of it, I might be a stylist if I'm working with a, say, a fashion photographer. Mm-hmm. I may be topping in a more sadomasochistic play scene where the play is the thing. I may be dominating with rope where there's also a psychological emphasis on uh, power, temporary power distribution. I may also be um, creating or directing. Now, if I'm in, if I'm creating art versus playing, it's interesting because there's, there's a similar thing of what you're saying. In my play, I am, anytime there's a concern from the person bottoming to me, I'm going to, um, I'm going to work with that immediately. If you said, no, I, I got to come out of it now in a scene. Yeah. Um, let's see. We got a comment here. To describe linguistically, but very recognizable in a shot. Okay, let's see. Um, Let me go back to the question in a moment. Let me finish my thought here. Uh, If I'm creating, co-creating and collaborating on a scene with you, anytime there's sort of an adjustment or a limit reached immediately, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas when I am creating, creating a performative work or a work of art, I am a lot harder on the person and I'm going to want that five more minutes, but also in creating those artwork, I am have a very different expectation of an emotional engagement and emotional investment. Mm-hmm. Right? So if you and I, two same people, two, the same bag of rope, if we were playing, is whole different than if we were creating art or performing. If we're playing, I am going to hope for a both parties being fully uh, invested and and present and having some both parties, not just the person bottoming, not just you, but mm-hmm. both parties having some sort of an, an emotional uh, experience, right? It may or may not be emotionally intimate. That is a different thing. Right. Yep. Right. I still but agree. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'm in. I'm, in. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm swimming in the same waters. Yeah. But if we were performing, let's say if you and I were doing a performance at sea, I actually don't want you to go fully into like uh, the gooey rope head. Mm-hmm. That's not helpful. That's it's dangerous. not helpful. I, because what we're creating is something that we're creating a performance. I want us to be communicating. It's funny uh, when Kumi, Kumi Monster and I used to perform a lot together. 
and mm -hmm. oh, her performing skills, amazing. And her faces of ecstasy or bewilderment or suffering. Now what was happening behind as we're performing and I'm, you know, whatever character I'm taking on, she'll turn around and go, yeah, you can lift my head, uh, my leg higher. Like, okay. Like, and then at some time she'll be like, okay, dinner after this? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> Or things like that. I'm not, I don't want a deep emotional um, sinking into that space because I, you're a collaborative performer. It's like you and I are doing a pas de deux. You know, I'm just the guy lifting you in the pas de deux. And, you know, you're, you're the dancer. Mm -hmm. How I distinguish between art and play, and there's a difference between art and artful. And, and I know that there's a lot of uh, folks who are, excited about the art aspect of lowercase a art aspect of shibari kimbaku japanese inspired rope a play a scene can be artful but the central focus is still the scene and we are consenting to creating an experience together for our recreation mm -hmm. When we are, but not all artful experience must be or should be art. And here's how I make the distinction, right? Um, and because the term art gets used with so many unspoken expectations. <laughs> <laughs> a scene is what we do for ourselves, for the now, and for our recreation. And art is creating something for an unknown third party to create an emotional experience or a visceral experience for an unknown third party down the road. So our experience now is as creators as mm -hmm. opposed to experiencers. Yep. That's how I make the distinction. I want uh, to take I, a look at the, the question in here. Yeah, so do uh, I, because comment. this will actually cause riff off of what I want to say in regards to what you just did. Yeah. Uh, should I repeat the question? Please do. Okay, so um, Stella said, in my own consumption of rope photography specifically, I think the art of a shot captured mid-play versus a shot made from a shooting perspective are so different from each other and something hard to describe linguistically but recognizable in a shot. Um, and so what I want to say about that also applies to what you say is that there's a difference between art, uh, and this is specifically about photography, there's a difference between art and documentary documentary or documentation of something that happened can be art but it's not necessarily art so uh so i agree that like a lot of times you can see when um when something is captured mid sh uh shoot or, or mid mid play or, or mid scene as opposed to mid shoot and sometimes you just can't i know lots of people who are really great actors and you know, I have been in the room with the juries for the Seattle Erotic Art Juries where they're talking about a piece of art going, look how authentic that is. I mean, you know, you can just see that the people are super into each other with the eye gazing and the tension, you know, the way they're holding the rope and pressing against each other and their eyes are locked. And this is just an amazing, like, capture of, like, a real authentic connection in a scene and me having to keep my mouth shut because i was there i helped with the lighting and those were really good models who were really good actors and they portrayed that connection and that tension so beautifully um so there in, in that situation it yeah. does not make my as as the the viewer it doesn't make my emotional experience any less on the nose. For, yeah, for people having created an experience that grabs my heart. Right, which is why sometimes it is not, like, I don't think it's necessary to know the what happened in the shoot at all. It's fun to know those stories, but um, I only encourage people to ask those stories if it, if it helps them 
with making a connection to the piece. Um, because if you can look at a piece of art and have this experience into it and uh, and make a connection with it, and you've made up a story in your head. Like to me, that's my favorite kind of art is the one that I'm like, what's going on here? I need to figure it out. What's the story? Um, he, I'd like to wait to hear what the art was uh, was made, the, the concept that the art was made in mind until after I've already decided what my own relationship is with it. So it's not influenced. I want to have, I really enjoy that art as a mirror. And I have pieces of art that I adore that I have never found out anything about the artist or about the conditions that were made because I'm so happy with the story that I have in my head. So there's a comment here that uh, is, a, is not all of life and its experience art in it, art itself though. I disagree that documentation isn't art. If it's presented to be viewed by others, I think it's art. I, 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 here's what I heard. Sophia says, not all documentation is art. Agreed, some, yeah. Some not documentation. Part of it is. Yeah. Some documentation may be in order, to, like, in order so to hold on to a memory. Mm -hmm. Some documentation may be for technical review. Like, there's, like, documentation photo of my reversals and such that I never want somebody to see. <laughs> or only see it as a process of production, mm -hmm. right? Um, as for the comment of, is not all a life and its experience art itself, though? It now can. we're getting into a realm of philosophy. Mm -hmm. Now, art, life can be lived artfully. Um, I mean, all we have to talk about is... Uh, uh, Oh, I don't want to get the name wrong. I want to say Judy Montana, the artist who uh, had seven years, uh, a, a seven year art project. Uh, now I'm going to have to look that up because I don't want to be wrong. Um, but all seven years, each year she wore only one color. She spoke with a, an accented English for the whole year and she went through red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and it was a seven year project where she Everything that she did, she wore only that color, and she spoke with that with a particular accented English. And there's, so, in, yes. there's intentionality. There is yeah. intentionality in that. If um, if I spend a year wearing only black, it's going to be very different. If I, it's just because I live in New York, <laughs> um, versus <laughs> versus I <laughs> intended to do so. Um, now. Before we go dive into, yeah, know, we might not want to know. We might not. Yeah, I think, know what I think is art. the direction that, of philosophy that requires a PhD level of time and conversation. But I want to go back to rope bondage and play, rope bondage as play and art. Um, and we've spoken about how the the. The use of the word art can get people in, into hot water around consent. Oh, yes. Yes, I would love to go in that direction. Um, one of the things that I see all too often is the, I thought we were just doing uh, rope for art's sake, and then the next thing I know, you know, there was kissing and there was this and there was that and there was all this sexual stuff. Um, and I really see that being a big crux is that, um, and I'm gonna be, I'm gonna say some things that might be a little unpopular. So I'm just gonna acknowledge that this is my point of view is that I think that in the rope, com rope bondage community there for a while, and I don't know if this is still going on, but for a while, there was a really big push to say, this is an art form as a form of legitimization. People wanted to do it as performances out in public. They wanted to be able to do it as, you know, like rope bombing where they were doing it off of trees and public structures, but it's just art. It's not, it's not a sex thing. And 
I think that really comes ultimately from a sex negative point of view of like, um, whenever you say it's not about the sex, it's about the art. I think um, that's a way to hide your own discomfort with sexuality and because you don't want to get any rebuke from the culture at large. And so there was this big push in, you know, I would say like the, you know, late uh, aughts and early, you know, teens, you know, I'm talking like uh, 2008, 2009, 2010, where there was a really big push to go, no, this is art. And then a whole bunch of people came into the rope community with this idea that it's just art. And then when they started interacting with people for whom rope was a part of their sex, they're using these same words to say, I do rope bondage and I like to have pictures taken. And then there are misrepresented expectations of, well, of course there would be kissing and fondling because that's part of rope and sex. And the other person going, of course there wouldn't be kissing and fondling. This is, this is rope and it's art and you don't do that in art. Um, and so we had a real, and I think that can be a really big part of why there um, were so many um, consent violations that were being brought up, especially around people who were performing with each other, um, is that mismatch in expectations. And so that I think it's that that desire for legitimacy in the in the larger U.S. culture that pushed people to go, oh no, it's art. Yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> there's a, in contemporary art, in contemporary art, there's a profound amount of, shockingly, there's a profound amount of sex negativity and discomfort. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes why uh, queer art as well as uh, marginalized people addressing their sexual identity mm -hmm. in artwork get sidelined or shot uh, is this sex negativity. However, okay, Yvonne can actually have, create art in which, create art that involves rope that may even create a sexual response or an erotic response in the viewer down the road that does not have to include uh, sexual contact between the creators, mm -hmm. right? And then there's play in which there may be varying degrees of expectations of what is sexual contact. Mm. Oh, so, <laughs> yeah. What is sex is probably a bigger conversation than what is art. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, even bigger. Um, can you, stripping names and details, Mm -hmm. uh, can you give some concrete examples in which consent episodes around art and bondage? Just Ooh. to give people a sense, because, because many of the viewers may not understand what we're talking about. Let's see. So one of the biggest things, let's see, I'm trying to think of something that wouldn't be too recognizable. And uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll try to put a couple of different things and mash them together yeah. for so that it's a combination of... And viewers, we are doing this because we don't have consent to explicitly mention. Yeah. This. Um, I want to consider these as more um, generic case studies to illustrate how the consent issues may happen. In some cases, they're consent violations. In some cases, they're consent incidences. And <laughs> how this could have happened, because we tend to, we tend to treat, um, uh, talk about consent as if it's just simply a yes or no, and everybody understands what they're saying yes or no to. Right. And, and this so is a whole series. So if you would um, give us a case study where we can get a better sense. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, a good case study we'll take, um, we'll do the, uh, the photographing rope art uh, scenario. And uh, I'm just going to mishmash a few things together. But the idea being of that um, you're 
a person is there, they're in rope, and then all of a sudden their labia starts getting rearranged so that it looks better for the photo. It's like, is that sex or is that art? For some people, it's touching their gen their genitals are being touched, and therefore it's sex, and that's not acceptable. And to another person, it's just like, I have a vision. This is the way it needs to look, and you have a little bit of toilet paper there, honey. I had to take it out. Um, or and, even if it's not sex, there's, there's still the consent issue of consent. There. Yeah. Right. Bodily autonomy. Mm hmm Right. So the consent is still important in there, but how big of a deal it is depends on how uh, on um, on what the expectations are of that situation. Um, and so, of course, bodily autonomy or consent consent is needs to happen in both of their places where it's like, I'm really sorry, you have a piece of toilet paper and it'll take way too long for me to untie you. May I please just take that off of your labia? Um, and if the person says no, you have to untie them and then you have to deal with that. And that's the way that goes. But in a sexual situation, you know, where you have negotiated that sex is a part of what you're doing and jet touching genitals is a part of what you're doing, regardless of whether it's sex or play, it's been negotiated now. There's a lot of people who just think, oh, we're doing rope, we're automatically doing sexy things. And then that asking isn't even happening just based on the assumption. Give us another case. Um, another case would be the having a model who's tied up and uh, the, uh, the person who's doing the tying um, go in and start kissing them. Because in their head, it's you know, this is what we do. This is how we get the good pictures. This is how we get the connection as we start kissing to build this up. Uh, you know, and again, all comes down to consent if you just talked about it ahead of time. So I know we can't legislate everything that we're going to do ahead of time, but here's the list of things that we might do. Would you be open to all of these? It's amazing how a lot of these problems that if you just asked first, we wouldn't have this problem of is it acceptable because we're in a sex scene or a play scene, or is it a, is it acceptable because we're making art? Uh, I have a, a situation a friend of mine went through, and I would consider this a consent creeping. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And I have permission to talk about this. Awesome. All right. So this was a modeling, not bottoming situation. Mm -hmm. A professional photographer, who professional commercial photographer experimenting with his erotic portfolio, okay, hires somebody to do the tying. In other words, hires a rigger and a stylist and hires a person to model, to receive the work. So we have three people in the room. Right. We have the person with artistic vision. We have the person who's putting on rope, who's a, a technician and technically skilled, who also plays, plays in his private life. The person modeling and the person styling have no previous interactions. All three are strangers. This almost sounds like a clue. <laughs> uh, and it sounds like things I've done before as a, as a model. Photographers, <laughs> photographers setting up the photo, uh, the person doing the, the styling, the rope styling, and the photo does not include, is not to include the stylist. Okay, photo does not include the stylist, just the person modeling. Mm -hmm. right? So as the stylist is, rope stylist is doing his thing, and my friend who's modeling is in a suspension, the stylist in the middle of it starts hitting her up for a date. <laughs> <laughs> We're working, honey. You need to you need to save that until after it's over, <laughs> right? And and I, I want to and in the meantime, the photographer is just you know setting up his camera and his lights and all of that. In this case, okay, I, I want to give you this case study. It could go in a lot of different directions. Um. 
if we just left the picture right there, right? So it could go in the direction of, um, now given this case study, what and potential, I consider this a consent creep, mm -hmm. right? What are your thoughts on the directions it could go from that situation and why that moment is problematic? Because that moment may not, uh, was not seen as problematic to a photographer nor the person who was styling. Right, and see, here's why I think it's problematic is that a person who is tied up in suspension they are dependent on the stylist. That person right there is dependent on the stylist for their safety and for being let out. And it's that dis and it's that imbalance of power that makes it a problematic situation. And I agree that that's not a consent uh, injury. I, I think it's definitely a rude and creepy thing. And it's definitely a power play to do something like that when you literally have someone within your power. I mean that that person's off the ground. I mean, unless their hands are free, they can't they can't get themselves down. Um, and so that's why it's problematic. And now, how problematic it is depends on the person in this in the um, in the road. Because if I was there, it would be like you need to ask me this question later, and you need to get me down now. You know, you you need to get back to work, and let's focus on what we're doing here. But then I have the internal fortitude of, you know, of I've had enough practice saying no and having it honored that I'm not scared to try to, to enforce my no's. Um, yeah, but I'm also, yeah. I'm also a professional and I'm not gonna go into headspace. If I, was, if I was someone who was not a professional model and a professional bondage model who could control that aspect of headspace, then that's extremely problematic. It, it becomes suddenly exponentially problematic because this person has already slipped into a space where they're not able to really, you know, uh, they don't have full agency anymore if they've gone into headspace. It's like having a couple of drinks. Yep. Yep. It, mind is slightly, if not a lot, potentially altered. In, mm -hmm. Uh, and I want to refer to, you, you haven't seen this video, I think, yet, but I had a fantastic consent dojo conversation with Marla Stewart oh. about the, the power and privilege that we bring into a room before even the rope applies. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned something about internal fortitude and practice. Um, depending on who we are relative to each other in the room, right? we may be socialized for more or less privilege. Mm -hmm. In this case, you had a white male photographer, white male uh, stylist, white male popular stylist. Mm -hmm. so that's actually key because there was a, a social cachet that he carried right? yep. and we had a minority cis female mm -hmm. in the rope and in this condition dear viewers there's a very different power dynamic that happens that the individuals are either can take the privileges for granted or may be in a situation to have to to gauge risk or power or assumptions mm -hmm. in a situation, people with lesser uh, power privilege in the moment may assume that they have to say yes, or they have to answer the question. Mm -hmm. Even answering a question, feeling like one has to answer a question or feeling like one is entitled to an answer is coming from a place of power, uh, it has a power differential. Now, in this specific case, my my pal, while cis female and minority, was also a professional performer mm -hmm. and a professional circus performer. Mm -hmm. uh, so she essentially just rolled her eyes, and then I get the phone call later saying, "Oh my God, so and so, what a creep." Mm -hmm. But what then happened is I'm going to bet 
that subconsciously the quality of the photo shoot would have been affected. Mm -hmm. The body tension. You've been in a situation, you've been professionally uh, uh, rope bottom modeling. How would that affect your, your creative collaboration? Oh, it would, it would really tank it if I felt like, and, and here's why it would tank it for me is because they, the stylist, speaking of the stylist, weren't taking it seriously enough to focus on what we were doing. And that would, and that's that disrespect for the artistic process. Um, I would assume that they would, that they have the same disrespect for me as an autonomous human because we're supposed to all be there working towards this one particular vision. And, you know, they might, whether they go, hey, baby, want a date? Or whether they're like, I wonder if I left the oven on. Their mind isn't there. Like that's a that's still like a disrespect for the process. Yeah. <laughs> Although with the, I wonder if I left the oven on, I'd be concerned for them too if I were in the room. Right, and it would still ruin the shoot. Even though yeah. it's a valid thing to be concerned about and have your mind elsewhere, mm -hmm. it's still going to ruin the art. Um, and, and, and this is why asking me some things about, uh, about art, I'm like, so I am, I am a hardcore submissive to art. <laughs> I will always, if it, if there is any chance that good art will come of something, I will ruin my body for it. It is so, it's, it, it's, it's not the best place to come from, but that's where my passion and dedication is to, to art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I and I include that as to, so that people can go. This is one far end of the spectrum of how people, what people are willing to do for art. It's totally fine to be on the spectrum of you messed up my hair. I'm never doing this again. This is terrible. Um, art in the con play versus play versus art making and rope bondage and consent. What other thoughts are popping into your head right now? Uh, that I'm a real prissy bitch when it comes to having the kind of play that I want to do. It's like I deserve to be abused in exactly the way that I want to be. Um, and I negotiate for that. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> um, and also, uh, it to get a little bit more personal, part of my kinks are pleasing my partner. And so that's a really like delicate, uh, uh, delicate line to walk for me to maintain my, uh, my arousal and my excitement to know that this is something that my partner wants while it's still in line with what works for me so that to be within my consent. Um, so in some ways I'm kind of a nightmare to deal with, with that because consent is so important to me, but this little wedge right over here, right here, that part right there is where I cannot like it, but if you're really having a good time, it's okay and I'll roll with it and it'll actually work with me really great. Now, um, challenge for you. Yes. We have been talking with the assumption of consent creep, consent incident is happening to the person within rope. Mm. Oh no, I'm I'm the person that's I have a bad habit of pushing the consent of my, the person who people who taught me. Okay, let's talk about that because when we are talking about uh, consent and image creating, let's call it mm -hmm. image creating right uh whether it's documentation whether it's uh, uh whether it's styled um styled and staged and set acted uh, image creating okay uh in terms of pushing on the consent of the person casting the rope uh, let me play devil's advocate how oh, did that it. happen I have a, I totally have a, um, a perfect thing that I feel comfortable completely sharing this is the, well, I, uh, and this, I would put this in the consent creep, uh, section, maybe consent incident, um, it's right on the edge there, but 
you know, being with somebody who I was a play partner with and saying, well, I really want to get tied up. Look at these fabulous new hard points that just got put in. Oh, well, I only have two pieces of rope. That's enough. I'm strong enough. I can do that. And having it be incredibly uh, uh, poor decision-making skills to use that four millimeter rope as both upline and uh, and body body wraps. Yeah, four millimeter. <laughs> yep, we did it. He, was, he 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 actually was like, never again, never again. This is a terrible idea. <laughs> okay, then so clearly though, why it was a a consent creep, and and for the viewers, what we mean by consent creep is that it's creeping towards towards a potential consent issue, right? Mm -hmm. Not the person may or may not be creepy, but the situation is creeping towards. Mm -hmm. um, spell it out clearly because the assumption is if the person is casting rope, styling rope, putting on rope or dominating, that, th that how could their consent be pushed? Right, Where and their consent was pushed in that on, on first discussion, they were like, this is just not safe. And my attitude was, it's safe enough for me. If I get hurt, it'll be fine by me. Um, just because I'm willing to take the risk of injury doesn't mean that it's, uh, that, that supersedes another person's uh, level of risk uh, on what they're willing to participate in somebody getting hurt. So, if so, I was, so what I did is I kept pushing and I was like, every time they had a concern, I would say, this is why I'm okay with that. This is why I'm okay with that. Never taking into account that they sh that they're not being okay with it should be respected. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I never got a no, but every time a concern was brought up, I was like, I counteracted with, this is why it's okay with me. This is why it's okay with me, which was very focused on myself and what I wanted, which was to be tied up at that point in time in this, you know, in this really like, ooh, it'll be fun and, and sneaky and no, you know, nobody knows we're here and we're kind of not supposed to um, type of thing. And it was all focused on my wants and desires rather than collaboratively with the other person to be like, okay, so you're saying you have concerns about the risk. Here are my concerns. Does that, does my lack of concern or my willingness to take that risk okay with you? You know, I did. I never turned it around and checked in on the other person. Ah, see, that's the key, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I yeah. had. So if it were say between you and I, and I'd be like, oh, I don't know if that would be safe, and you're like, oh, uh, you know, you'll be fine with. I'm like, really? Okay, <laughs> that'd be very different than. But what about this? And what about that? And I'm like, it'll be great. It'll be great. Don't worry. It'll be great. It'll be great. <laughs> yeah. And if we, and, and this part, I, I have, I think we both met people who were talking where afterwards they feel kind of icky that somehow their concerns were bowled over. Right. Being used as basically a life support system for the rope. Right. Yeah. What I call a carnival ride operator. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and for people out there who like to cast rope, um, styling, rigging, or topping, or dominating, your emotional boundary is legitimate. Whether you are receiving rope or casting rope, your emotional discomfort is legitimate. Your mm -hmm. emotional discomfort may be a yellow zone, it may be a zone where it's exciting because it's scary, or it might be like, I don't think I'll feel good about this. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's legit. Um, and I think we should also call out the idea is that those, uh, those boundaries are going to be different with different people as well as different on which side of the rope you're on. Like there are things, there are things that I will do as a bottom that I absolutely would never do as a top because I'm not comfortable taking that responsibility. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like take neck ropes, for example, you know, putting rope around the neck. Sure, go ahead, do it to me. It'll be awesome. It'll be fun. It'll be great. Um, I don't do that. 
to other people when I'm topping. I think it's a bad idea. I don't want anything to accidentally happen. I don't want to be responsible for anything like that happening. So thank goodness there are tops out there who will take that responsibility with me when we do neck ropes on me because so, I want to experience it, but I'm not comfortable enough to do it to somebody else. So in other words, you would never top yourself. I wouldn't. I'm a terrible boss. <laughs> I'm so dangerous. <laughs> and yeah. I have, uh, so so my main squeeze when we first started dating, um, we started doing breath play and it was something new to me. And uh, they said, oh, you're new to breath play. You should read Jay Wiseman's All the Scary Reasons to Not Do Breath Play. And afterwards I was like, I could die? This is so hot. <laughs> Let's do it some more. <laughs> Likewise with skydiving, right? Or scuba diving. Oh, yeah. I would never I would never skydive unless um, the plane was falling apart. That, I think that's foolish. <laughs> we all have our different levels. Yeah, and see, I've jumped out of airplanes for work, so. Rock on with your badass. Yeah. Um, if work yeah. required that to me, I'd find different work. <laughs> oh my God. Um, this is a sticky situation, isn't it? It's, mm -hmm. it's very nuanced. Yeah. And this is part of what makes it so juicy. Um, uh, I recently had um, a partner who was not new to kink, but uh, I would say that he was kink adjacent. Mm -hmm. um, and where he, he was totally one of those people where it was like, if it turned me on, he was all about doing it but he had a lot of concerns about some of the rougher play. And it took a lot of really nuanced conversations for him to, to understand that, yes, it's okay to push and get me into that realm of you're not sure if I really want to do it, but if you really want to do it, I'm going to be excited for it because you're forcing the issue because you're exerting power over me. And that was, that was like three months of weekly, you know, we were having like weekly dates and, and we talked about it every date and it took about three months for him to be like, okay, so I can just do this thing and you would be okay with it. And then I would say, yes, that would be super hot. So <laughs> pausing you just a sec for the emphasis for the viewers. Mm -hmm. This was a three month negotiation. It was. It was a three-month negotiation to get him to do consensually non-consent type activities with me. To three-month negotiation to explore each other's emotional and activity expectation. And it is not just about consenting around a certain technique or tie or position, but the, the bulk it sounds like the bulk of the negotiation was mutual emotional understanding of mutual emotionality, mm -hmm. expectation, and also him getting you to understand his emotional state. Yep. So it's not necessarily the bulk of it. Now I'm assuming that there was like technique negotiation and uh, body boundary and hard limit technical negotiation. But the bulk of it, what percentage of the three month of negotiation was the technical, the bodily limitations, bodily autonomy limitations and emotional? Um, I would say that technique was probably around 5%. Um, bodily autonomy stuff, I'm gonna put somewhere in the let's say 15% and 80% was uh, the emotional um, the emotional negotiations. And, and a biggest part of it was an understanding of that gray area of how we would handle consent incidences. Because I was specifically asking for activities and for situations that might go wrong because you know I am a pretty princess with that wide of a, an area that's the perfect you know 
fucked up thing to do to me, <laughs> but go outside of that and I'm going to not be happy with it. And so it was also negotiating the, you know, even coming down to if you do it wrong, I promise I'll let you know you did it wrong so that we don't do it again and I won't hold it against you. We may have to, you know, and then we'll work together to repair it so that we can keep going forward. Um, and so it was a lot of setting intentions. And he had very clear ideas of like uh, emotional boundaries of like, I will do this amount of intensity, but I won't go into this realm once it starts getting into, um, you know, into certain areas. And I'm, you know, I'm trying to be a little bit vague here on purpose. So I apologize for that. Um, we have three month negotiation. Mm -hmm. right? Um uh, and by the way, the whole time we are having sex and doing play that we easily agreed upon because there were certain activities that were like, he was like, tie you down and have sex with you? Sure, I know how to do that. That sounds great. <laughs> and even as your relationship, your play and your sex is happening, there's this overarching like three-month conversation. And I'm sure there are like re individual reflecting how about after the scene? That was where the most of the negotiation happened, actually, is every time we would do something and he would edge a little bit closer to what I was asking for, then we would spend a whole bunch of time kind of, you know, uh, how do you say it, uh, debriefing, you know, you know, pillow talking our way through. How was that? How did that make you feel? Did you notice how I reacted when you did the thing? That's me. That that reaction means I liked it. So a lot of it was also teaching each other that when I have this type of reaction, that's a really that's like a Kelly Green go. And okay, when I see you pulling back and doing this, I need to shift my expectations because now we've hit the wall of where his comfort was in in that activity. You know, so it was like being able to learn each other's tells. And our nonverbal, like giving words to our nonverbal communication so that it would shorten the uh, communication style the next time we played. Mm, yeah, this is the part in my, when I'm teaching my negotiation class, I refer to, to what do you look like, sound like, when it's good for you, not good for you. And here's what I, you might see of me and hear from me when it's good, not good. All right, so let's think in terms of that. The three month free play, you got the 5% technical, we've got the 15% bodily autonomy, 80% emotional. Then there's the scene, and then the, uh, and I think in terms of a, a singular scene, because I'm thinking about time investment, right? Mm -hmm. And then after that singular scene, how much for the debrief and the after play conversation? and after play whatever each of you needed uh i would usually say anywhere from a half an hour to an hour mm -hmm. um and part of that in all honesty was part of his sex play of the juiciness of reliving it um emotionally um so that happened even if we didn't do it like a little bit always happened after because that's just you know that felt so good when you know, like that kind of is like it was a big part of his style and how his play worked. Um, so I can easily say, and I know a half an hour to uh, you know thirty to sixty minutes sounds like a lot of time, um, but that was part of the wind down. I you know it was rolled into our aftercare type of thing. Yeah, I don't know if it sounds that long. I, I, it sounds great. And were there any other phases or reverberations of? of coming back with each other and talking about that particular scene? Um, depending on on intensity and how close we were to each other's boundaries, it was definitely a, a check-in afterwards. I would say, you know, a couple of days. Sometimes sometimes for me, it um, when I go through an experience, it takes me a few days to really kind of settle into it. Um, so I also think that that's a, and, and so that's something that I started doing when I know when I started noticing a pattern of people who were having these consent incidences um, that turned into consent violations is that so many of them there was a breaking point where 
if just a couple, like at some point after the event itself, when it was kind of like, oh, you stepped on my toe and you didn't even say sorry, is kind of like where it came down to, where if somebody just would have said, hey, you know, we had this experience, it seemed like it went really good, but I just wanted to check in with you. How are you feeling? Has, you know, anything changed for you? What came up afterwards? Like if there was some kind of like, I care about you and your experiences um, type of check-in. Um, whenever we do something like kink, uh, especially more intense types of kink or close to um, close to our boundaries or close to our edges. Like uh, uh, I think I use the term edge play to mean any play that is close to somebody's personal boundaries and edges. Like I don't think edge play can be put in like this type of play is edge play. Because, you know, for some people, kissing a boot is, whoo, that's super edgy. But nobody's going to die if they kiss the boot. I mean, maybe if they, were, they weren't clean, somebody might get sick. But <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, the, so the actual scene after the three months of the negotiation, how long was the actual scene? Um, uh, it was a series of scenes. It's how I wanted to play all the time. Mm -hmm. And okay. so, uh, so we went, we, um, we dated for another, uh, 12 months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Now, so there's this, in order to get to, to the place where you wanted to go to and he felt permission to go to an understanding of your desire was all of this before, the things that were afterwards, as well as the, the specific scenes. Okay. And this makes, this makes for consent, collaboratively creating consent to be very challenging. But what about for pickup play? What about for somebody that, that how does one navigate consent or can they navigate consent and playing at one's edge, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever that is and consent if one is not say dating or even pick up play. Pick up play for the viewers, that means when you just meet somebody and say, hey, wanna play. You may even be acquainted with each other, but you're not um, playing regularly. Mm -hmm. Um, I, for myself, there is play that I just don't do with people that I'm not in relationship with because it would be too dangerous for everybody. And by dangerous, I mean the, the chance that there would be a consent incident. Um, <clears throat> it, it's, I think that the risk of it not going well, and because I don't know the other person's you know enough about them to gauge how how much i can trust their intention if i'm in a relationship with somebody and i have learned them to be a generally well-meaning person who you know when they step on my toe it's because they didn't see my toe it's not because they purposely looked for my toe and stomped on it um you know that's kind of how i look at consent incidences is that harm was done and it wasn't intended but how we react to that is is very is is as much as important as whether it was intended or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, to take that analogy further, if I accidentally step on your toe and you say, "Hey, ouch! You stepped on my toe," and I'm like, "What? Get your toe out of the way!" Um, that now has become a consent incident, whereas if or, or a consent violation because I am disregarding you and your bodily autonomy. Whereas if I'd gone, oh my goodness, I didn't see your toe there. I'm sorry, those shoes are so big. I, I need to watch where I put my feet more often. See what happens when you play in clown shoes? Yep. <laughs> it happens. Or if you're like me and you have really big feet. <laughs> great balance, though. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so we've got about 15 minutes left. Okay. And this is... If I were watching this and new to kink i mean you know between the two of us we have a few decades of kink experience mm -hmm. right Maybe a couple <laughs> yeah um if i were 
new or relatively new and watching this, I'd be like, well, this is so nuanced and um, there's so many rooms for fucking up. Uh, oh, oh my God. Okay, what do I do? Um, so bringing it back to art, making art versus making scene mm-hmm. and consent. What are some simple advice that you might give you know understanding that there's all of this nuance and it's a mm-hmm. lifelong of under, understanding and practicing this what's some usable news you can use right now for the viewers probably the biggest thing that i would say the one thing that i would suggest is negotiate whether pictures are going to be taken at all you mean because- it doesn't <laughs> you know, lots of people have, a, you know, I've had lots of times someone where I'm in rope and somebody's like, oh, this turned out really cool. Do you mind if I take a picture? And it's like now that that shifts it. And now it becomes about the art artistry of the rope and less about our experience with each other playing with rope. And so negotiating whether there are going to be pictures ahead of time or not can let you know if that shift is going to ever occur. You know, and then that way, if you're like, you're playing with someone new and they're like, hey, am I allowed to take pictures of once you're in rope or, um, or will you take pictures of me in rope? You know, if you don't want the, the focus to shift from the two people or the, however many people in their experience with the rope shift, as soon as you bring out that camera, it suddenly becomes only about the rope and it's less about the people. And that's, and that's unless you know that's going to happen, that can go poorly Mm -hmm. because it's unexpected, that shift from all of a sudden the person doesn't matter, the rope does. So what's a concrete phrase that somebody might include in their pre-creation, pre-art making, or pre-play conversation? Mm -hmm. Um, Probably a good thing to would be to say, hey, let's talk about whether we're going to take pictures of the rope or not when while we're playing. And if the person is like, eh, if it turns out good, I, it would be great to get a snap. Um, and then it could be like, okay, but you have to wait until after I orgasm or after we're, you know, you know, after we're done doing all the things we're going to do in rope before you take me out. Um, you and know, like, no, and no is an acceptable answer. Yeah, and no is like, you know what? I don't like to play with cameras. You know, uh, my main squeeze is a is a fetish photographer, and he has a rule that he's like, I'm a terrible photographer when I have a heart on. <laughs> Wait, can you say that again for emphasis? <laughs> Many people are terrible photographers when they have a heart on. Yeah. I've noticed that the really good photographers are able to distance themselves um, while they're doing their art. Or and maybe they're photographing and not doing the same thing. Exactly. And that's a concern is that, you know, if you don't, if my partner doesn't, is like so focused on the art that they are not engaging in their sexuality while we're doing rope play, it's no longer a scene. It's not play. So this is when a third party photographer mm-hmm. uh, or documentarian uh and documentary artist make art making comes in handy. Exactly. Hey, what are some of your favorite um, documentarian uh, photographers? Uh, the first one that comes to mind is David Steinberg. Mm-hmm. Is um, David has perfected the art of being that fly on the wall with people, um, where he can um, and his documentation uh, it is art where he's catching these beautiful moments of connection where people have forgotten that he's there. Um, and there, and he's very good at getting very raw, uh, very unfiltered, very authentic interactions with people. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and he's told me it's because you, you take 50 pictures so that you can get that one great one. Um, and you spend most of, he, you know, he told me once that the, he pretends to take pictures for the first, like, 20 minutes while people are just getting used to him being there. Oh, okay. Before he was digital, he did, he wouldn't have any film in the camera when he still shot actual film. 
for the first roll. <gasps> he just he just learned not to put anything in the ca- any film in the camera. So he'd click and take pictures and fiddle with lights, and that would get the people used to him being there, and then they would settle into their own thing. Desensitize, great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are some uh, other documentarian, uh, especially around rope, but generally documentarian erotic photographer? Ooh, you know what? I I'm gonna be documentarian. It's not my style. Mm-hmm. Like I'm 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 interested in in rope bondage uh, photography or art that tells a story. Mm-hmm. Um, like there's uh, Stella Polaris uh, does beautiful drawings of rope bondage that I find to be very, um, very lyrical and sweet uh, that I greatly enjoy. Um, let me think of who else. Barbara Nicky. Yep. Definitely, um, definitely yeah. amazing at the um, uh, documentarian as artist. Yeah. Um, uh, do, do you do much with rope? I don't. I think yeah. I don't think I've seen rope specific stuff from her. Uh, I think she's more of a generalist that she will yeah. catch when she can and when she gets the opportunity. Yeah. Um, also, another good generalist, uh, but uh, also the nightlife scene, Efren Gonzalez. Oh, okay, Efren right. Gonzalez. Oh yeah, Efren Gonzalez. Uh, Mark Chester, especially for portraiture of kink relationships, I'd mm-hmm. say. Um, yeah. Huh. yeah. Yeah, I'll have to think, I wish I would have thought to think about that, that so that I could have a list for you. Like right now I'm, um, right now I've been really enjoying getting into uh, the idea of painting rather than, and drawing rather than photographing rope. Mm-hmm. Um, I find that, uh, when somebody can technically make the rope behave on the canvas the way it does around a person is just it's just a little extra juicy to me that i i just can't uh, you know i i I just absolutely adore um and there's a yeah uh, right now the artist i'm super into is actually behind me right now and this is uh ray aquino's work who is um a non-binary artist who is um go by coastal uh, Seattle and Washington DC um, and they're right now they're working on all non uh, non-binary portraits um, that duality of masculine and feminine within one person and so this can you say their name more slowly Ray Aquino spelled R A E Aquino is A K I N O um, they're on Instagram as Ray underscore Aquino and absolutely amazing, uh, amazing work. Um, and uh, they did, uh, I first invited them to a show with Michelle Surchuk. And actually, there we go. There's another photographer whose documentary, uh, documentary goes into art um, on a show on fetish. So Michelle Surchuk has this series of the, inter- of, uh, the internal fetish uh, portraiture. And so, um, when she did her show, I invited Ray to create some pieces as a counterpoint and just the the amazing like use of blindfolds and rope, the way that Ray incorporated that in um, and was able to counterbalance Michelle's um, erotic portraiture with these very, uh, very stark paintings. I wish I had one of them here to, because uh, this would actually be perfectly talk about what I'm into right now. Where Maybe, maybe in my Patreon when I have you as a guest speaker. Yes, I I can. yes that would be yeah. great because then I can, um, uh, I can have images available for that. Now we've got just about five minutes uh, left here. What other concrete advice or takeaway might you have for the viewers who are navigating this very complicated area and if any of you out there are feeling like you know the the whole uh that consent is is challenge doing well by consent is challenging you are right uh and keep keep working on that mm-hmm. so takeaways um 
pretend that you are a small child again and ask why about everything. If somebody says, I don't like having rope around my neck, ask them why. Because there will be something within that why that you will be able to go, oh, you don't like any kind of constriction um, that uh, makes it feel so that you can't breathe. Perhaps I shouldn't do a corset tie on you either because that is also compressing and makes it difficult to breathe. So um, I think when we're asking for somebody's consent, always asking why is going to give us information that builds our nuance. Uh, 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 what is the word? Um, naturally. Like we, you don't have to have a big vocabulary and, and be able to delve down deep emotionally, but just asking why. And to the viewers, I, I would think that ask why as a genuine curiosity, not a demand. Because yes. There yes. are many people who use why as a weapon, weaponized why. Mm. Well, why? I'm going to rephrase that. Say, thank you. Will you explain why to me so I can understand better? There we go. Yes, that very good call, because that's another nuance that I think that people like me who I, you know, I tend to be uh, poly, Pollyanna, very like it, I, I'm an, um, uh, an insufferable optimist. I assume the best intentions. <laughs> um, yeah. I forget that a lot of times there are people and that can be. Yeah. And, and also we can there. perceive just that way, even if we don't mean it. So um, if you if you're. If you're not, if you feel pressure from a why, it might be that you're, that it may be, or you might be hearing it as something that is pressured or weaponized. And it, also, if you're somebody who's not always good at picking up nonverbal cues, because that's a lot of us, mm -hmm. uh, just saying why can be taken in many different ways. So what was that phrasing again? Thank you for that boundary. Can you... Tell me why so I can better understand. Thank you. Uh, you also help organizations with um, consent situations, no? We do, yes. Um, so um, the parent organization of the Seattle Erotic Art Festival is the Pan Eros Foundation. And one of our programs is uh, the Consent Academy. And so we work with consent education. We help businesses and organizations help create their own consent policies. And um, our biggest goal with that is to help create consent culture. Um, the best way to get rid of rape culture is to have a consent culture. Fantastic. Thank you so much for spending time with us here in Consent Body Thank Study. You. Pardon me <laughs> for the sound on this end. Oopsie. <laughs> All right, then. Now let's give this uh, episode of Consent Dojo a wrap. And I want you all to go out and practice and build up the consent muscle. Thank you so much for having me, Midori.